So let's talk about trends and the little moments in between. Spotlight. Welcome to the show where we talk about underrated songs. The place that I want to start today is with these gigantic monolithic tent poles of culture through which we assign the different eras and maturations of pop culture to. For example, it is very commonly known and cited that the early 90s, particularly here in America, is the grunge era. And while that is no doubt true, it is also very apparent to everyone that obviously not every great record from this era is grunge. So moving a decade forward, we're going to talk about a different tentpole in a slightly more niche corner of the music industry. This time it's indie, and the thread connecting them is shoegaze. Shoegaze is also a genre that had its commercial and arguably creative peak in the early 90s around the same time as grunge, and it's kind of become a favorite among a lot of young people these days. You don't have to look long online to find praise for records like Suvlaki and Loveless. But there was also a time where shoegaze was about as far as one could possibly be from the cultural zeitgeist of indie music, and that is in the 2000s. As the story goes, there's this little album in 2004, you might have heard of it, Arcade Fire's Funeral. And in indie music, this thing is kind of a big deal. Rarely is a record the combination of critically acclaimed and commercially successful, as well as influential that funeral is, and it set off an absolute wave, a wave of indie artists getting rootsier, folksier, rawer, occasionally more stripped back and reserved in their instrumentation, and sometimes even lo-fi in their recording style. This stuff would go on to influence the cultural zeitgeist of indie music for a very long time, getting into the Bon Iver, Fleet Foxes, Pitchfork, indie blog era of the genre's development. But while all this was going on, unsurprisingly, in the cracks, there are some absolutely remarkable bands that are making indie music that sounds nothing like what everything else is. We can highlight artists like the radio department LSD in the search for God in broadcast, but today I am going to talk about a personal favorite, Amusement Parks on Fire. <laughs> Amusement Parks on Fire, shoegaze, bedroom pop, dream pop act, founded by one Michael Fierick. Fuck, I hope I'm saying that right. British, Nottingham, 2004. They released three albums in their original run. The self-titled debut, which was released on a label that actually has some Portishead connections. Shortly followed by a second record released on uh, Richard Branson's V2 label, which if you're familiar with the British rock and roll scene of this particular era, you no doubt know this label well. The band went on hiatus for quite a while. It was in that hiatus where I learned of and began to fall in love with their music. They released a couple of EPs a few years ago and finally punctuated it all with a brand new album in 2021, which I reviewed and ended up liking quite a bit. It made it on my best albums of the year list last year. But for the purposes of this video, we are taking it all the way back to the band's self-titled 2004 debut album, which, as I understand it, is basically a solo project of Michael's. It seems like all of these songs were written, conceptualized, and even largely performed by Michael himself, and I think that gives the record a really, really clear vision and a really raw edge to all of the abrasive sounds it mixes in. And now we finally arrived at today's underrated song, which comes later on in the track list, an absolute little gem by the name of Smokescreen. Yeah, yeah. Smokescreen begins slowly at first with some droney, distant guitar reverb and amplification. It starts off with these 
rumbling, rising drums before erupting into the first verse. And you'll certainly notice immediately the dense layers of sound being worked into this song, a trademark of shoegaze, as well as the echo and reverb that is applied to so much of the vocal and guitar work you'll hear here. You have these soaring, almost cascading lead vocal refrains that are just flying out of the mix, but the song is not in any way triumphant. It is a dark, even dreary portrayal of shoegaze and dream pop music. This thing is heavy, it is thick, it is elastic, but I would not call it transcendent. If anything, I would call it painfully real. I've always been really fascinated by the lyrics on this song, particularly on the hook and surrounding refrains. Another petrol fire, another dead excuse, another crumbled spine, another year of abuse. But it's not for us to say. These lyrics and really the entire song are full of this vivid, compelling, and engaging lyrical imagery, but in that very songwritery kind of way, it's all a little obtuse, sounding cool and summoning imagery of all kinds of different fascinating little microcosms, but putting it all together, understanding what it was inspired by and what it's trying to say is difficult from how scant the lyricism is here. And with so little resources out there specifically referencing this song, I kind of found myself in a lock while researching this video, wondering what the motivation and inspiration for the track was with no real resources to look for. So I DM'd the band on Twitter and Michael himself responded to me and was cool enough to answer some of my questions about the song. The first thing I asked him was about this particular lyrical passage, which has always been a favorite of mine, and just the lyrics about the song in general, trying to get a feel for what they were trying to say. And this is what he got back with. Hey, Lav. Me. So I wrote It, Smokescreen, in 2003 when I was still in my late teens in the wake of the invasion of Iraq as kind of an anti-war protest song, which is a sort of goofy shit one does at that age. Correct. I'm talking about the arbitrary nature of borders and beliefs based on a shared but disputed history, human sense of entitlement to a fanciful narrative of our own creation, and our willingness to kill to enforce it on others and to reinforce it on ourselves. Now, obviously, that is a systematically intense explanation, but it added all of the context that I needed to go back and listen to this song and really start to put the pieces together. The lyrics really do display in short form some of the subject matter that he discussed in this answer, and it makes the sound of the song feel so much more vivid, so much more immediate when I listen to it. It feels like the nature of the track had transformed formed from this dreary, almost apocalyptic prophesizing into this immediate, almost call to action or anguish, this expression of just lack of understanding over what was going on in the world at the time. He was also nice enough to tell me a little bit about why this song is called Smokescreen and the imperialistic smoke screen that we have to cloud all of these actions in in order to preserve our own morality and sense of right and wrong and yeah it seems like those themes are becoming more and more relevant by the hour it was really interesting unraveling the fact that this is a bit of an anti-war protest kind of song while all of the Ukraine and Russia shit is unfolding before our very eyes. If you're watching in the future, don't spoil it. I have no idea what's about to happen, but it's February of 2022, and it really seems like the shit is about to hit the fan. So, in order to escape this world wrought with horrors beyond human comprehension, let's take a trip back in time to 2004 and try to uncover why this great song and great record never really got the credit they deserve. Well, there's a bit of a 
contradictory dichotomy at state. Like I talked about earlier, the zeitgeist of indie music was firmly in the world of indie folk the moment that Arcade Fire's funeral hit and became a sensation. And while obviously that's not the only record you can point to and say it inspired the change, it's the flashpoint like Nirvana's Nevermind that we use to make a concise and neat little ball out of these grand sweeping cultural changes that tend to happen. So amusement parks on fire were far from the only victim of this exact same thing, but in another sense they are also just one band in a pile of what feels like thousands of British rock exports from this era. While shoegaze is a lot heavier than many other genres and, and micro genres and niche genres that would fall under the indie umbrella, that makes it a little bit closer to rock music, conventional rock music, than a lot of these other bands, acts, artists ever would be. And we were seriously not short for British rock music in this era. After the strokes erupted and brought that sort of exuberance, that swagger back to rock and roll, it infected the UK. And over the next few years, we see the Libertines, Franz Ferdinand, Arctic Monkeys, and then literally thousands and thousands of British rock acts who are one to no hit wonders emerging and disappearing throughout this entire era. So if you were to hear an Amusement Parks on Fire song, if you were to look at some of their contemporaries or maybe the label it was being released on, it may not be clear to you immediately what sets them apart from so many of their contemporaries, and that's if you even heard this music, which is if you're a fan of indie music around the time, there's no guarantee. But while I was researching for this video, I found a quote that Michael gave in an interview that I think speaks to what makes the genre of shoegaze and the music of Amusement Parks on Fire so endearing. That whole noisy pop shoegaze thing has never been a fad as such. It's probably gone in and out of fashion 50 times since we last made a record, but there seems to be this hardcore fan base who've stuck with it throughout, and even though we've done very little for seven years, it feels like they've stuck with us too. This is a wonderful little microcosm of why I feel like shoegaze, dream pop, bedroom pop bands will never die. This fan base is eternal, including me. I will always love music that sounds like this. There is something so emotionally punchy, powerful, heavy, and engaging about the combination of those walls of crushing noise and the beautiful harmonious moments that pierce through them and soar over this sea of reverb and effects, this absolute wall of dense noise. And that's exactly what Michael accomplished here on Smokescreen. He made a really endearing, really intense, really engaging classic that I fell in love with as soon as I first heard it and have continually been baffled by why this thing is not more universally recognized for just how great it is. But that's my part. I've done what I can. If you've watched this entire video and don't have a desire to go listen to this song, I don't know what else I could possibly tell you. But if you like Shoegaze, if you hear this track and you enjoy it, check out their entire debut album. I highly recommend it. Check out their most recent album, which I enjoyed. You can read my review of it if you want. I'll also include a link to the band's store in the description, so you can go check out their music, buy it if you like it, support them. It seems like a really cool thing to do. And also shout out to Michael, I, I genuinely thought about scrapping this episode because of how little uh, my research was garnering, but he answered my questions and he made this whole thing kind of possible from a top-down critical analysis standpoint, which is really freaking cool of him to do. And that's all, it won't be long before I'm back again with the February, January update video, bunch of kick-ass music in 2022 so far. And uh, I'll see you then.